Good morning. It is great to see all of you wonderful folks here. We're going to start in the Majesty Hymnal, the Burgundy Hymnal, number 22. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and bless his holy name. We're going to sing all three verses. Let's stand together as we sing. asked to pray today and before I do I need to talk to you about something um, I've got a little problem here but Adam was kind enough to stir my memory we uh, had to leave for a couple of months to go up to Michigan and we left uh, it was kind of in July August and I lost two months and uh, to me it's just into the summer but back here it's time to get ready for Christmas. And so, I think you know what's coming, don't you now? All right. For those who have been around for a while, we have some parades coming up, and we need candy. And we need good candy. So that means chocolate. Lots of chocolate. And... Brother Steve. So, anyway, you need to be looking for deals. Now, I know we haven't even got past that little holiday called Halloween, and we don't want Halloween candy, okay? We want, you know, even though that's a temptation when it goes on sale, let's not get the orange and black. Let's be looking for others. But if you start looking, now's the time. Get the big bags, um, and we'll stock up. If you bring it in, just give it to Brother Adam. He's been pretty good over the years. He usually is just one for one. Uh, so. Uh, <laughs> That's how he keeps his weight down. But anyway, if you'll help me with that, I'd appreciate it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the day. We look forward to uh, you working in our hearts and lives through the word of God. We thank you for how you've used so many people this week uh, to reach out to others. And Lord, as we have opportunity now to worship you, to sing, to just immerse ourselves in the word, I pray that you'd be with those who would present it here in this auditorium and around the campus. May you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> With a thought there, too, that he said is sometimes the outside of the bag will have a Halloween theme on it, but inside the candy is just says normal Snickers, normal Three Musketeers, uh, whatever. So don't shy away just if it, you see that. Look, inspect it a little bit. You may be able to, to use that. And a few announcements here, uh, so EBC teens and their families, this is for you. Don't forget tonight is our family cookout, and that will start at 4 o'clock at our house. Uh, each family is asked to bring either a dessert or bag of chips and a two-liter drink. If you could help us out, that would be great. And then we are planning to 
uh, uh, take our senior high group to Pensacola Christian College for college days down there. So parents, an email went out this week, a lot of information uh, from the college as well as from us. If you have any questions about that, please see either Jamie or myself. And we can help you with that. And then don't forget, we're talking about November, which is crazy to think about. But November 25th will be our pie and praise service. That will start at 6 o'clock, I believe, in the gym with the pie. So 6 o'clock on that. Don't forget, that's a Monday night. We made that shift a couple of years ago. And that is in place of our Wednesday night service for that week. A thank you note here from the Griners. Dear Emmanuel Baptist Church, thank you for inviting us to be a part of your missions conference. We were overwhelmed by your generous gift of gift cards, which has already been so useful to us. Despite the unpredictable weather and circumstances, everyone at Emmanuel continued to be such a huge blessing to us. You all have been in our prayers and will continue to be. Thank you for your heart for missions. The Griners to Anaconda, Montana. So good to have Brother Jason Woon, Brother Nick back with us, and uh, so thankful they were able to take their trip. We rejoice for what they were able to do, rejoice that they're back. Brother Nick's going to come, share a testimony, and then we'll hear from Brother Jason as well. So, we were given a time limit. 57 minutes, right? <laughs> okay. We could easily spend many hours, each of us, on, on what, was, what was accomplished and what we've seen and heard. Praise the Lord, the gospel is being preached. Um, there, there are so many needs still. We, we had an amazing time. Um, I've never been on the back of a motorcycle before. That was very fun. <laughs> Uh, and oddly enough, far preferable to a car. If you s have seen their roads, you would understand. There, there are many things that I would try to explain, and if you ask me personally later, I'll, I'll try to explain it. <laughs> but there are many things that are, almost can't be understood unless you go and see it in person. Um, we, we met so many sweet, amazing families. We, we were treated amazingly. Like, in, in their culture, they treat a guest with the highest honor, and it is, it is amazing to experience. It feels weird because we always want to be humble, and we're like, no, no, please don't, don't do this for me. You know, you don't have to do that, but they want to because they love, they love treating people with such hospitality and sweetness and compassion and kindness. Um, <laughs> I, I've very much enjoyed the privilege of being Nick Uncle, to like 30 kids, and I've loved every second of it. Uh, the Wounds and, and many other missionaries, they earn every penny <laughs> that we give them, I promise you. There, there are so many luxuries that we do without, and there are many things, I uh, wouldn't have thought of done it that, doing it that way here, but it works. They, they practice the ancient art of make do. And, <laughs> I want to praise the Lord for the, uh, the opportunity to come. Uh, I want to praise the Lord personally for the fact that without the new job that God gave me many months ago, I would not have been able to afford it in the first place. <laughs> but I'm glad for safety. I'm glad for the experience. And like I said before, there's so much, so many details that I could give. Ask me later. <laughs> I don't have the time at the moment. But I'm, I'm so thankful we got to go on this trip. We thank you for your prayers. It was an amazing time. Well, he only took two and a half minutes, so that means I get uh, well, about ten minutes now. So please open your Bibles. To, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, I, I first want to thank my Father in Heaven who just uh, allowed us to take uh, this trip. And what a, what a great privilege it, it has been and just a special thing for us. Uh, I want to thank my church family for being behind us and for praying for us and just keeping up with us. Uh, and that, of course, leads me to I want to thank my wife who updated and, uh, you know, uh, just supports me and um, helps me plan. And 
writes my sermons. <laughs> and they were really good, too. And um, now I just uh, want to praise the Lord for, for his work. Uh, you know, really the, the purposes that we had was, was kind of, or that, you know, I had going there was kind of fourfold. Uh, definitely, you know, first of all, ministering to our church there, Berea Baptist Church. And uh, we had our Bible conference there. And so uh, it was just, it's so encouraging seeing the personal spiritual growth of, you know, we've, we've not been there among them. And to, it's almost like when you, when you haven't seen someone's baby for several weeks and then you see them again and all of a sudden it's like they've doubled in size, you know. Uh, seeing the spiritual growth of our people there has been such an encouragement and that they're, they're learning to, to live for God on their own and uh, that uh, seeing the spiritual growth of, of Pastor Levy also and how he is, how he is being a shepherd there. Uh, just, it, it, I tell you, it encouraged my heart. Uh, I was basically just there for counsel, for, you know, help where I could. But, you know, there, I can see the church is starting to own the ministry. They're starting to take that ownership and making decisions. And uh, so the Bible conference went well. I didn't do really do anything in the organizational part of that. Uh, Pastor Levy took care of all that, and and some of the men helped him with the, you know, with all the activity of that. And so I praise the Lord for that. And then uh, of course the new responsibility that I have as Asian field administrator with our board, and, and I got to visit a couple of other missionaries that are serving there, and just spend some time with them. And as you know, so, a couple of them have been through some really difficult things here lately, and and just being able to, to come alongside of them and encourage them, and, and they're encouraging me as well. Uh, just the, the way that I see God enabling them uh, to serve him in a, in a difficult place, it's, it was such an encouragement to me. And, and then just it was a great blessing to be able to share all of that with, with uh, Brother Nick. And uh, just, you know, we, we kind of designed the trip around it sort of being like a, uh, a survey trip for his sake uh, and just to give an experience of what life is like in a, in a foreign field especially you know a, a field that is restricted access and um, and so it, it was a great blessing to be able to share those things and um, the challenges of daily life that you have to deal with and and the the culture stress and uh, the the spiritual darkness and oppression uh, that that we deal with but but then there's the sweet fellowship of the body of Christ and uh, I can tell you that when when you get around the believers in a place like that uh, you realize how desperately you need that in such a dark and oppressive place and uh, we were so encouraged getting around the believers and you know brother Nick was such a great help to me and I want to thank him for coming um, he was my pack mule he, he said I'm, I'm here to assist you and uh, I, I really believe that if there wasn't that backrest on the motorcycle he would have been falling off the back of that because we lo I loaded him down several times and I could hear him straining and grunting and everything else as, as we were going over across the road but uh, the Lord really blessed us and, and I'm just so glad to, uh, to be part of that and then uh, the, the transit going there and back uh, we were given several opportunities to witness uh, to some people I, in, in Charlotte airport there was one man from from there from that area, an older an older gentleman couldn't speak English, and I saw him there sitting. I, I recognized, you know, that he was one of one of our people, one of our kind, and so I just sat down, and started talking to him, and his eyes lit up, and and he was so happy that this white man could speak his language, and and I was able to help him, you know, with some getting on the plane. They had some changes, and so he had to go back to the counter and. And uh, he didn't even know. He was just sitting there waiting to load the plane, and he had no idea that they were calling for, uh, for his, you know, him to come. And so I was able to help him. And then uh, coming back, I mean, there, 
there's, there's lots of stories like that we could share where we were able to share the gospel with taxi drivers and, and uh, just people that we met in the airport. But I tell you, the, probably the funniest thing that happened was we were in, we had landed in Boston after that long uh, 15 hour flight and we had to rush because the flight was late. We had to rush to get to the next gate. And so we, we jumped on the bus. We had to go from, uh, from Terminal E to Terminal B. And so we jumped on this bus. And I mean, there's hundreds of people everywhere, right? And we're jumping, we jumped on the bus and we're sitting there across from this, this you know, other couple, obviously American couple. And, and uh, they were like, we have been following you. And it turned out that they also went to the same place and they had been following us. And we were like, oh, that's interesting. You know, they, they, they went there to do some tourism and, and uh, this was like a big deal to them to, to be part of that. And so they said, we saw you on the plane. And we're like, oh, okay. And, you know, where are you heading? Oh, we're, go we're flying to Charlotte. We got to hurry to get our plane. We're like, that's where we're going, you know. And I, t I said, well, he, you know, he's from Lattimore. I'm from Grover. And he... And they're like, oh, well, we, we live in Kings Mountain. <laughs> and I said, well, we would love to have you at our church. And they, they said, oh, well, where's it at? And I said, it's on Canterbury Road. And they looked at each other and they said, we live on Canterbury Road. <laughs> From the other side of the world. They followed us and they live right here in this area. Chad and Teresa, we invited them to church Please pray for them. I'd love to see them come. Uh, they, they said they weren't going to church anywhere, and so we just want to praise the Lord for what he did, and thank you for the opportunity, Pastor, to be able to share. Amazing. Thank you so much for that and what the Lord's doing uh, in so many ways. How he orchestrates things is just amazing. They got to spend time with one of our missionaries as well that happens to be with their board so they were able to help them with the flooding that just recently took place and be an encouragement to them as well and so we're just grateful uh, for what the Lord did and uh, grateful that he's home for a few days before he heads back out on another eight day ministry trip so I pray uh, for Brother Jason uh, as he does that. Uh, Brother Bob mentioned the parade that's coming uh, it's a, a little bit unusual we every once in a while it lands this way because of the way Thanksgiving is so late, the parade will be the weekend of cantata. Okay, so the parade's on Saturday, cantata's on Sunday. That happens every great once in a while. And uh, so the Wednesday immediately following Thanksgiving weekend, we will put those bags together. That Saturday will be parade outreach. And uh, so if you can just be thinking, I know it seems like a ways away, but it's not really that much. We'll give you a little more details about this later, but just want you to know that the Outreach Corps is also working on another uh, outreach that will center around Thanksgiving. We're going to try to give out some Thanksgiving turkeys, uh, and we, we don't want to take away from the candy aspect because that's too, that's too valuable of an outreach, uh, but there are people in our community that are hurting, so we thought we could do that. Our goal with this is to get them on our property. That's a big deal with this particular turkey outreach that we'll have them come here to pick up a free turkey. We'll give you more details about that later, but if you can just keep that in mind uh, as well, and we understand there's only a limited amount of money, okay? So we got that. We figured out with some outreach budget that we have that there's some things we can do uh, to accomplish this anyway. We're going to work through our Bible clubs, some other things with that. So there's a number of things that are happening outreach-wise over the next month and a half uh, or so, and uh, so we're looking forward to an opportunity to impact our community uh, in some of those ways. All right, Brother Dave Carpenter, would you come uh, to the platform? I've asked him to pray this morning. Uh, pray for Brother Dave as uh, he is having some physical issues. The doctors are working there. We, we Lisa and I visited with them uh, Wednesday morning in their home and so forth, but I continue to pray as God works. And men, would you come for the offering as well? And I've asked Brother Dave to pray, and then you, we'll take up the offering. Dave, thank you, Brother. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as I come to you this morning, Lord, I just thank you for saving my soul and bringing us back into thy house this another time, Lord. 
I thank you for the report that Jason and Nick gave on their trip to Nepal. I just praise you for what you're doing in their lives, Lord, and with the people in Nepal. I, I, I ask thy blessings upon the offering this morning, Lord. May you multiply it, and may you receive the praise and glory for everything that's done. Lord, I pray that that would be with Pastor as he brings a message this morning, Lord. These things I give you the honor and the praise, for it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Number 72, the master of miracles is Jesus. And let me just say, there is a really good reason why they have Pastor Adam keep the chocolate in his office and not mine. <laughs> Let's stand together as you sing the first and last verses, number 72. Uh, 
Thank you so much. That's a wonderful song. I appreciate that very much. Well, we've been looking the last couple of weeks at biblical manhood, and we started out in 1 Kings chapter number 2, verses 1 and 2. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. And you may be thinking, Pastor, you've read that verse three times now and you haven't even gotten to that text. Well, I'm going to get to it. It's the very last message in this series, okay, Uh, which will not be this morning either. So I'll read it a fourth time before we actually get to that text, but we are going to get to it. Uh, But it's a a great place to to go to, show thyself a man. We talked a little bit about what does it mean, Uh, biblical manhood. We talked about the man itself is defined by the biology and by the Bible, (laughs) and we must allow those things Um, to be part of what we do. We talked a little bit about toxic masculinity uh, and how there were people in the Word of God who were toxic in the way they handled their leadership, uh, either tyranny by Nabal or Eli by passivity. God judged both these men because they were wrong kind of men in the work uh, there. Uh, Then we worked through a number of definitions and looked at the secular world and how they defined that. Our main thought as we work through this text is we must know how the Bible defines manhood and obey what it commands of us, not how the world defines manhood, on both positive or negative. There are some things where people say, well, that's a positive thing, isn't it? Yeah, but we don't allow the world to define it. We want God's Word to define what it means for us, and that's important. So we looked at the principle first, the foundation. Where do we get this from? Well, we get it from God's Word. Uh, that God created man and woman, and He created them in His image. 
Uh, he created them dependent upon himself. Man's not self-sufficient, no matter what. A uh, woman was also created by God as a part of that process. Um, the world's continual existence depend on a man and a woman. Very frankly, regardless of what the liberal world wants to tell us um, today. And then Jesus confirmed these distinctions in the book of Matthew, the Gospels, as he was here on earth. Now, last week we talked a little bit about the problem. Uh, we are fallen human beings. We have sinned. And so as a result of that now, we've got issues coming in, right? We abuse that which is right and we don't do that which we're supposed to do uh, and so forth. All have sinned and every relationship we have is com uh, contaminated. That's the word I want to look for uh, with that. The fall distorts the roles, promotes rebellion against God uh, and specifically the God-ordained or order. And we fail to mature and we fail to train not only ourselves, but our young men that we have a responsibility for uh, in the church. And then last week we started also looking at the perfect man. That was our Lord Jesus Christ. And we looked at, first off, his eternal mindset. Uh, he did the will and the work of the Father. He was filled with the Spirit of God, the Word of God. Uh, he gave the gospel to others and he lived a holy and obedient life. He also had the wonderful balance of love and understanding... He sought to meet the needs of others. He sacrificed himself and his own desires. And he was gentle whenever it was possible for him to be gentle. But he also had zeal and courage com combined with some confidence. He led the disciples and others. He showed initiative when he should have. He confronted when necessary. He confronted the religious establishment. He confronted those who were violating in the temple uh, and those things. And he was decisive according to God's revealed will. Once God told him what the will was, and you're like, well, he told him he knew he was God. I got all that, I'm just saying. Once he knew the will of God, he did it. He set his face like a flint, uh, no matter what, to discourage him. And so that's where we left off last week. So I want to pick up with the fourth truth about the perfect man, and that is he was conscientious. He was conscientious. And that it flows into some of these other things, but he fulfilled his responsibilities. In John 17 and verse 4, it says, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. In John 19 and verse 30, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. In other words, our Lord, if you will, and I'm not being disrespectful, but our Lord crossed every T, dotted every I, and he was in complete control. And when he was finished, he dismissed his spirit. He willingly laid down his life. What a wonderful truth. He fulfilled his responsibilities. But number two, he was diligent in those things. In John 5 and verse 17 it says, And Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Uh, and he was willing to do that which God had accomplished in his life. Hebrews 12 and verse 2 and 3, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. So in the midst of all of this difficulty, in the midst of all that he knew he was going to face, he did it anyway. And why? Well, for the joy that was set before him. Wow. What an amazing testimony he is to us, so he was conscientious. But number five, he was humble. The Bible tells us that he served and listened to others in his leadership. In other words, he was not a proud, lording it over others type of leader. In John chapter 13, verses 12 and following, it says, So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garment, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. Now, this is interesting. He wasn't denying his position. This is who I am, and you're right in saying this is who I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, ye also are to wash one another's feet. Guys, I'm telling you, serve others. 
And I don't care what position you're in. I don't care what your title is. I don't care what. Serve others because I'm here to serve you. I've often thought of this passage. Of all the things that I would want to say to someone on the night before I died. This would probably not have been one of them. But that's what our Lord did. And he not only told them, but he showed them. To say, this is what I have done. For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. He was establishing a whole new way to do ministry. It wasn't going to be because I'm a Pharisee, because I have all these things in a row, you serve me. No, 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 he was saying, no, that's not what kind of kingdom I'm setting up. The people who are going to lead, they're going to lead by being a servant. They're going to demonstrate that. They're going to, they're going to sacrifice. They're going to give. They're going to be those kinds of people. And I am setting the example for you. So guys, when you enter a room, you don't walk by the basin leaving it to someone else to do. That's in essence what he was saying. Because they had all done so. Not only was his humility seen in his service, but his humility was seen in glorifying the Father. In John chapter 8 and verse 50, And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. John 8 verse 54, a few verses later, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom you say that he is your God. Jesus was constantly turning that to God the Father. I'm going to glorify Him. And again, what Jesus was saying is as we serve, we're not to take the glory to ourselves. It is God. And as we said a couple of weeks ago, if you think you're all big and bad, try breathing on your own. Because you can't do it. We're not self-sufficient. We need God in every way shape and form. So he was the perfect man. Now you may look at this list and go, wow. And and with good reason. But the truth is, if we look at this list, these things on this list, and I want you to hear me out closely, okay, because I don't want you to think I'm being heretical. The things on this list were not God things. And what I mean by that is they were not things that's impossible for us to do. The, the things on this list, he did, it didn't say, and he breathed out of nothing the world. Because I don't care how much you try, you're not going to do that. All of these things, if you will, were man things. They were things that if we choose to do them, we can do them. Well, let's just look back. Can you glorify someone else? You could turn the glory toward God the Father. Can you be humble by serving others? We, we can. Uh, can we be diligent? Can we fulfill our responsibilities? Can we be decisive when God's will is revealed to us? Can we confront when necessary? Can we show initiative when we should? Can we lead and disciple others? That's what I mean by this. Obviously, we know that he was fully God and fully man. I'm not denying that. What I'm saying is there are God's characteristics that you and I cannot do. But there are these things in which he chose to do, and we can do them by choices. But we have to make those choices. And yes, we're fallen people. But when we look at them individually, it's like, okay, Lord, those are things that I can daily choose to do. And it's helpful for us. I want us to look at, number four, what I've called the prototype. That is... Someone or something that serves to illustrate the typical qualities of a class. So what would it be that would make a man? Obviously, we have the perfect man, and he's given us this great example. Uh, But as I researched and just looked, there, there seemed to be really four things that stood out about men, godly men, throughout history, in the Word of God, and so forth. And so I just want to quickly cover these particular four things Number one, he needs to be create, cr- courageous. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 13 says, Watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit ye like men, be strong. And Douglas Wilson in his book, Future Man, says, Our boys need to learn humility 
And they also need to learn boldness and courage. The only way to accomplish this balance is through the grasp of who God is. Either they embrace humility without boldness, which in boys is effeminacy, or they embrace boldness without humility, which is destruction. So how do we balance these things together? We balance them by knowing God. And we, meet, we need men who are courageous. That's something that is drastically missing in our society today. And we need to teach our young boys to be that way. And can I, can I lovingly talk to all you mamas for a minute? There are going to be things about your boys that you're not going to understand. There's going to be things they want to do that you don't understand. Can I warn you to be careful not to sissify your boys? Because they don't need to be a girl. They need to be a man. And, and they, need to, they need to learn to do those things. Now, I realize some of you ladies are sitting here thinking, yeah, but if I let them do everything that their father and they want to do, they may not live. I got that. God did balance us knuckleheaded men with our, the women in our lives. I understand that completely, all right? But, but can I just tell you, they have that, if you will, conquering courageous mentality in them, and we have to be careful that we don't, quote, unquote, knock it out of them. Be careful with that. They need, we need courageous men. Someone has said that if you're always tough, you're not a good man. And if you're always tender, you're not a good man. Balance toughness and tenderness. And number two, I think a second characteristic was purity. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 22, Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Dr. Martins in his book, Show Thyself a Man, taken from the passage we read at the beginning, says, The mind is the citadel of a man's life. And from this powerful engine, our wills determine where we are driven. The citadel of a man's life. The truth is, there's a lot of jokes that go around. Well, when I was a child... You know, we had to walk two ways uphill in the snow to go to school. You know, those kinds of jokes that go around. But you didn't have to walk two ways uphill. Anyway, um, but, but can I say something to you today? Our young people are growing up in a world that I believe, particularly in the area of the mind, is much more difficult than we grew up in. They are faced with temptations they have access to things that we did not have access to. We had access to them, quote, unquote. We had to go to a convenience store, and they put it on a brown paper sack, and you walked out of there, and most people considered you shameful to do that. Nowadays, they have access, so they can stumble on it. I'm not saying that every home has to do this. This is a personal standard, but it's one of the reasons why we did not have Internet in our home until my son graduated college. It's an incredible temptation. We have to teach our young people, particularly our young men, to be pure. To be pure. It is a battle for sure. Number three, they need to be proactive. That is, they need to exercise leadership. Um, and again, gentle, not harsh. 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 1. Now, Paul, now I, Paul, myself, beseech you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ who in presence and base among you, but be an absent and bold towards you. But Paul, as we know, we've been studying the book of 1 Corinthians. Paul was at times very bold, at times, frankly, somewhat sarcastic with them, uh, very confrontational at times, but also loving to them. And he says, can, can, I, can I beseech you, can I beg you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ... We, we, we think of those terms as being weak. Do, do you think Christ was weak? No, no, the truth was meekness was strength under control. He knew where to put that. Manhood is supposed to be self-sacrificing. They're learned to lead, but leading by shepherding and by giving of himself. 
not by lording it over people. So yes, he needs to be a leader. He needs to be proactive, but he doesn't need to be proactive to the point that it's my way or the highway. And, and men, can I say to you, if you have to remind your family to be submissive to you, you've got the wrong perspective. Your perspective is to love as Christ loved the church. And the last time I checked, that's a full-time job. Now, now, God reminds them to be submissive. <laughs> They're supposed to be, all right? Uh, but we don't need to constantly be hammering that. There's love as Christ loved the church. And then lastly, letter D, they need to be hardworking. That is not lazy. I, I couldn't find a P for hardworking, and I didn't want to force it, so there you go. Some of you are having a heart attack. I know, because it's not a four Ps. <laughs> Proverbs 12 and verse 24. The hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. By the way, each one of these points we could give tons of verses under, okay? Um, he needs to be hardworking. And when do we start that? Here was a rule in our home. If they could make a mess, they could clean up a mess. If they could dump the, blocks of, the box of blocks, they could clean up the box of blocks. Now, can I tell you, it took longer to clean it up than it did to dump it. And by the way, parents... It took longer for you to have them clean it up than you clean it up. But that's why we have mamas doing that for them, and we have college students coming to Bible college, and they can't even make their bed. If you're one of those, shame on you. You ought to be able to know how to make a bed, right? You need to be a hard worker. That's the deal in the process. Work will not kill you. Thank you, Pastor. You, you might think it will. Um, I might have been killed if I didn't work. So it was an easy option for me in the process, right? <laughs> that was primarily my daddy, not my mama, since she's here this morning. I can't get into, I can get in a lot more trouble because she's not in the camera this morning, so I have to be careful, right? <laughs> Dale Johnson says, we see very clearly that God has an expectation for what a man should be. He should be one who bears the burden. He should be the one who leads, guides, and protects. He leads not as a tyrant, he leads as one who is a servant. Amen. can I tell you that when you lead the way Christ led, it makes it a lot easier for the women to follow you. I'm not saying it makes it totally fine because they're sinners too. And so are you, by the way. So we got two sinners trying to work together, but I'm telling you the more you act like Christ the easier it is for them to submit and follow. It's easier for your children to do that. When your children know that you are willing to say, hey, dad was wrong. I'm sorry. I, I, I was short with you and I should not have been. And God convicted me. Men, can I tell you, if you've never said that to your children, there's a problem. Because I can promise you, you've made mistakes. 1,000% promise. As a matter of fact, I have good Bible to back it up. And we need to be that way with them. We need to say, hey, I, I, didn't, I blew it. I'm sorry. I, I was wrong in that particular area. And I believe we, we could break off these and talk about four or five things under each point. But I can tell you, generally speaking, that if we will have men who are courageous, pure, proactive, and hardworking, we'll have good godly men. And not just in the local church, though we certainly need them in the local church. We need them in our nation. And you think about many of these things that we can look back on and see characteristically in our nation's world. Well, I'm going to stop for there. But Lord willing, in two weeks, because next week we have a missionary, David Bennett's going to be here with us to report and be in that 845 service. But we'll look at the pattern in two very different men in 1 Kings chapter number 2. Uh, we're going to look at Solomon and David. Different leadership for different times. Okay, and this is, I think it's going to be an interesting study to work through both of these men. Both made mistakes. Okay, but in the height of their worship of God and when they were right with God, their leadership styles were totally different. And yet God used them. And I think it will help us as we work through that. So, can we bow our heads and close our eyes and uh, I'm going to pray in just a moment, but I'm going to ask our men to come and get ready for communion as we just quietly meditate for just a moment.
Father, thank you for your word. We need these reminders. I need these reminders as a man. And so we pray now that as we go to communion that we would honor you for what you did for us as a local church. And we'll thank you for that in your name we pray. Amen. Pastor Adam.
verse 24 says, And when he had given thanks, what an opportunity to give thanks. He broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Verse 25 says, After the same manner also he took the cup. Again, we will distribute and partake together. Brother Raphael, would you pray over the cup, please, sir?
Again, verse 25, after the same manner also he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. And then again, verse 26, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Why till he come? Because when we're in his presence, he's going to be our remembrance. So we rejoice in that. These cups are disposable and can be thrown away. If you take your hymnals and go to page 243, Pastor Steve will come lead us in verses 1 and 3, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. Let's stand together as we sing. When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of glory died My riches gained dismissed for Sunday school.